Hi there, the question today I'm going to talk about and answer, if possible, is can India become the next China, specifically when it's about manufacturing, become the factory of the world? What is this race between the dragon and the elephant all about? Now, one of the reasons I'm making this video is because tomorrow I'm flying out to Mumbai. I'm going to India and I want to watch, I want to see for my, with my own eyes how India has evolved over the past decade and what their plan is for the next decade. And so I'm going to share some of these insights in the future, but today I want to give a recap, a context on what I think the difference is between both countries and maybe whether India can actually catch up or even become the next China. Now one of the things that triggered me was a, a news article on The Guardian from Apple that decided that within the next three years, by 2025, Apple would take out 25% of its production of Apple phones, Apple iPads, so the Apple products, out of China and move it to India. And so that's a lot because China is now producing 90% of all the Apple products. So these would all now suddenly slowly go to other countries and specifically India. So is India ready to be the factory that China is today is the question to ask. Now to do that, we have to look a little bit at India and China in terms of many aspects. And one is poverty. If you think about both India and China, 30, 40 years ago, very poor countries. And China still had 754 million people living under extreme poverty line, less than two US dollars a day. Today, it stands at zero. Now, India didn't do so bad either, but it took a lot longer before they kick-started getting rid of extreme poverty. But over the past 10 years, India has taken out 271 million people out of extreme poverty. There's still 140 million people, which is one out of 10, that are living under extreme poverty. But it looks like by 2030, it should be eradicated. And I'm a big believer that once the eradication of extreme poverty kicks in, both countries, any country in the world, is suddenly able to move up because that is where everybody has an opportunity. Now, what does this mean for China and for India and what is the difference? Now, one of the things to look at to understand the situation of China and India is to look at history. If we look at history, for 2000 years, pretty much, China and India were the two biggest economies in the world. I mean, together they were making up almost 70% of the world's economy. Now that had to do a lot with the number of people they had. But at the same time, until the 19th centuries, that was actually 70 or 60% of the whole world's economy. And then that changed. It changed because of the Industrial Revolution, where Western countries, specifically first the United Kingdom or Britain, the Br Britain at that point, and then later America, they all started kicking in and be much more efficient, and the productivity level of these countries went up. And so they were actually competing with the Eastern countries, India and China, and they could outcompete them very easily. But what we have to think about is that we see a revival happening now. And since the last 30, 40 years, what we see is that both China and India have grown in terms of economy, and actually they're just reclaiming their situation, their position, and their status from before the 19th century back. And today it's almost already 30, 40% of the world's economy, and this could end up being again 50% maybe one day. So this is where we have to look at these two countries. Now, another thing to understand in the modern history of China and India is that since the 18th century in India and the 19th century in China, the foreign interference and foreign colonization of India, for example, and concessions in China has really made a difference for the evolution of these two countries. In China, they talk about the 100 years of humiliation. Well, in India, it was a lot about taking resources out of the country for almost 200 years and not giving enough back for the country itself to develop. Now, what does this all mean? It means that these two countries, China and India, for more than 100 years, almost 200 years, have been somehow dependent on the West and could not develop from the internal. Now that changed in the middle of the 20th century, actually almost at the same date. It's in 1947 in 
India, there was the Indian independence. What it meant is that for the first time they kicked the Brits out in a way and that meant that they could look at their own development and their own country and make their own governance and this became the biggest democracy in the world, specifically in terms of number of people. But in China was Mao Zedong in 1949, so two years later that took over the control over China, the whole mainland, and basically that was the moment where Mao Zedong said we will now be independent from the nationalists from before but also from foreign powers, we are going to decide for ourselves. And both China and India, although they're very different governance, I mean, there's a communist party versus a democracy. If you look at these two governments, what you see is that they were looking inward. In the 50s, in the 60s, they were really trying to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, not reliant on the West because of these 100 and 200 years of interference from the West into these two countries. They really wanted to be making their own decisions. And that kept going on in the 50s, in the 60s, but then something changed. What you saw in Asia was there were four big tigers, as we call them, Singapore, South Korea, there was Hong Kong, there was Taiwan, that were developing very, very fast. And the reason they developed faster had a lot to do with their interaction with the West, with the rest of the world, their global, globalized idea, the way that they did business, their economic model was all about looking outward, not looking inward. And so both China and India were watching these four tigers develop much faster than their own countries. And so this somehow created an instance of reflection inside these countries. And specifically after Mao Zedong died, and in India it was in the 80s, you could see that they started taking the model from these four tigers. For China it was clearly based on Singapore, and for India they were just wanting to go and also be part of this global transformation. The big difference between those two countries is that China looked at 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion at that time people that all had hands. And they said, they can all work in the factories, we can become the factory of the world. This has to do with manufacturing, with production. They just wanted to use all these people, that biggest resource that China had, actually to become part of this global supply chain. While in India, they were looking much more at the brains. They were looking at an elite, people that really spoke very well English, people that actually could do business with the rest of the world, that could help the rest of the world to develop the things that we, in Europe, in America, might not have enough people or not enough interest to do ourselves. And so India became the service industry of the world. They became the brains for developing IT, to do call centers, everything that we wanted to outsource, we actually sent to India. But here's where the big difference lies. In China, this was a huge population, a huge population that had hands. In India, it was only a small elite that actually could be part of this transformation. And although it's a lot of people, comparatively, this could not bring the country up as quick as China did. So they used a very different strategy. Now, can India follow China on the path of becoming the factory of the world and becoming the biggest economy of the world? Well, there's a few aspects. One of the things, as I just explained, is that for China it had all to do with atoms. It had to do with tangible things. It had to do with products, with building stuff, hardware. It had to do with logistics, with supply chain. This is the infrastructure that China has built over the past 30 plus years, while India was looking much more at this digital, this IT, this service industry. This was about using the brains. This wasn't about atoms. It was really about just bits and bytes. This was about data. It was about thinking in a more efficient way. And so this is a very different way of the transformation that we've seen. The problem with that is that the atoms were needed before the bits were needed because the whole internet industry came much later than actually the production industry evolved. And so this is why China evolved faster than India or earlier than India. What happened is that hundreds of millions of Chinese went to the factories to build the products that we love in the West, everywhere in the world. But the question we should ask ourselves is why did China became the factory of the world and not India?
And I've already explained, I mean, it's about an elite versus a mass uh, population that wants to use its hands. But there's other things. And one of the things is really the way that Chinese get educated in school. This is about being an expert, a master in something. They want to be really good. And for production, if you want to be good and focused on one specific thing, then that really works very well. But it's also this collective mindset that they have to all move in certain directions and the pragmatic mindset that Chinese have to solve problems. And specifically in manufacturing, this is constantly about problems. You have problems of payment, problems of delivery, problems of quality. I mean, there's always problems in factories. Well, for India, it had much to do more about using their intellect. It's not about pragmatism. And so I think the culture is partially why China became the factory of the world and not India. Because the Indians, although being maybe very, very smart people, I mean, they weren't as practical and pragmatic as the Chinese were, and they weren't willing to just focus on one thing as much and be the best in that thing like the Chinese do, which is sometimes obsessive with the Chinese. While in India, they've used their brains, they've used their talent, they've used their knowledge of English, their globalized mindset. And that meant that you have a lot of call centers, you have a lot of IT programmers. I mean, people were using their brains and were actually contributing to the digital transformation of the world, which was also very needed, but we also need products. And sometimes the products in the past were more important than this digital transformation. But this is where India actually excelled very much. And so what you really could see since the beginning of this century is that India's IT revenue actually started really booming after the year 2000, but specifically after the year 2005. And India became the global IT center for most multinationals in the world or many multinationals in the world, but specifically after 2005. And that had to do a lot with, of course, mobile phones. I mean, as soon as everything became digital and, and everybody became remote, it became a lot easier because everything could be done more easy and apps needed to be built. It's as simple as that. But also call centers were outsourced to India. So 2005, 2006 is where it really started to change just before the financial crisis. And India at that point was only the 14th largest GDP in the world. Well, in China, they were already on number five. Today, if you look at it, I mean, China's on number two and India is actually on number five. And if you move like five or 10 years from now in 2030, what you see is that India will be the third largest country in the world in terms of GDP and China will be bigger than America. And so this all changed in just 15 years time. And so this is where we need to look at in 15 years time, China and India have completely moved up. The only difference is China started moving up in the 90s, India actually around 2005, 2006, 2007. So more than 10 years later. But the ultimate direction is the same. Now what China has done extremely well and where India really has a challenge or will have a challenge to become the factory of the world is about infrastructure. I mean, this is about logistics, about supply chain, whether it's high-speed trains or it's deliveries or it's roads or it's airports or it's, it's harbors. I mean, China is just unbeatable. And that means that unless India can figure this out, it's gonna be hard to replace China's factories. The other thing has to do with urbanization. The evolution of China in terms of urbanization is a little bit different. I mean, it's quite different from India. In China, almost two out of three people now live in the big cities or in the cities. But it's also the type of cities that is different. In India, you also have big cities. I'm going to one uh, just tomorrow to Mumbai. There's in Delhi, there's Bangalore. I mean, there's huge cities in India as well. But you don't have like China, like a hundred plus cities with each one million people that are third or second, third or fourth tier cities, which are still pretty big and which had a complete transformation and become a modern city if you compare them with 20 years ago. Well, in India, most of these cities have evolved much slower and not at the same scale and speed. And so this urbanization actually will be needed to create a new economy that is the biggest economy in Asia after China. 
Now, what we've seen if we go back 40 years, and this is interesting, is that actually India had the same GDP as China just 40 years ago in 1980 when China started to open up. Actually, in GDP per capita, India was even larger than China because India only had 784 million people and China had already 1.2 billion. And so what you see is that both in growth and GDP per capita, India was doing much better than China was. 40 years ago. But they've missed completely that train, that high-speed train that China had to become a big economy in just 20 years' time. So what really happened? What we see is that in China, the GDP per capita increased 33 times, while in India, it was about 5.3 times. In Belgium, where I'm from, it's only 2.1 times. So, I mean, India did twice as well as Belgium did on average, but compared to China, it's nowhere where actually China has evolved. But we shouldn't underestimate it, because if you look at India and then you compare it with emerging countries in the world or you compare it with other countries in Southeast Asia in the Asia Pacific what you see is that India, India actually grew two to three times faster in terms of GDP per capita than most countries in the rest of this region or emerging countries and specifically if you look today in the year 2022 I mean China is at a growth maybe three percent we will know at the end of this year uh, I mean they wanted to be five point 5%, but it looks very unlikely this is going to happen. Maybe 4%, we'll see by the end of this year. But India will grow at 8%. And it looks like the next decade, India will grow at double digits compared to China, twice as much as China will. And so when China might be growing at 3 or 4% in the next 10 years, India might be growing at 6 to 8%. And so there's a big potential for India. It's like India's catching up to the growth of China, but just 10 years behind. And then if you look at purchasing power parity, which means how much money have to, people have to spend, you already see that India in 2030 will exceed the United States. China will be twice or three times as big, I mean twice as big as the United States in PPP, purchasing par parity. Uh, but the whole idea there is that actually this is all about quality of life. And this has to do with the middle class. Now, when we think about the middle class, China has now 230 million families, about 600 million people living in the middle class. That means that there's also still 700 million people that are poor. And so the whole idea for China going into that next 10 years is to take these people that are still poor, not extreme poor, but they're still poor, into the middle class of tomorrow. And so this is Xi Jinping's common prosperity dream. Well, India still needs to get all these extreme pe poor people in out of poverty and the poor people into the middle class. The big difference if you look at India and China is that actually India still has more than a billion people living in low income, which we in the West would, can, would say it's poor people. I mean, not extreme poor, but this is twice as much as China. But looking at the future, it's very clear that India is going to overtake China when it comes to the middle class. And so this is all about to happen in 2035 about. And together with China, and that's the interesting thing, is that together with China, 50% of the world's middle class will actually come from China and India together. Uh, but India will grow faster in middle class than China has. And this is an opportunity as well for India to actually become the factory and become become the economy, the second biggest economy in Asia. Now, what happened a lot in the transformation in China has to do with 2015-16, where Xi Jinping said by 2030, we're going to become the biggest economy, the biggest innovation country in the world, create a lot of tensions with the US. But this was the Made in China 2025 plan, the, there's the transformation or digital disruption plan, and so lots of stuff that China did, basically to become more self-sufficient. And so Xi Jinping clearly, in 2015, 2016 had a path on making China become more reliant on itself and less on the West. And they were right to have this plan because if you look today at how China is blocked out of chips, blocked out of 5G in many places and other things, I mean it's clearly that there's in the world some real tensions on supplying China with certain products.
And so when it comes to being the factory of the world, if you can't get access to these products, this is a big issue. Now that's an advantage for India, as long as they get along with the West, they can more easily get access to these products and these resources. But China is moving on. And I think India could actually catch up or become the next China or factory of the world that China is today. But that is the factory of yesterday. If we look at the factory of tomorrow, I'm not so sure India can catch up or even become the factory of tomorrow in any time soon. It could take multiple decades for India to go there. But what we see is that China today, it's all about this industry 4.0, all these disruptive technologies, 5G, IoT, big data, blockchain, you, you put it all together, it's all starting to become integrated, automated, the most industrial robotized factories of the world and specifically and that's what we often forget it often has to do with smart logistics and this is where India has a real challenge it's not just about producing the products you also need to have the ecosystem and send it out so this is where India really will have a hard time to catch up with the new factory of tomorrow that China is building now also the connections with the Belt and Road in Africa and Southeast Asia I mean even if it's about digital transformation or or, or digital connection or payments or whatever. I mean, it's all going very, very fast, very efficient and very, very cheap. And so this is where China and the world is getting connected when it comes to the factory of the world. But they also have the ambition to become the ecological and green factory of the world. And what that means is that if they can succeed, and we see it already today, with batteries, with electrical vehicles, with solar panels, with lots of things, is that we are becoming dependent on the green factory of China, not just the factory of China. And this is where India still needs to get started for many of these aspects. So I believe that China will always remain the factory of the world just because they are becoming the more efficient factory of the world, the more automated factory, the most integrated and ecological and sustainable factory of the world. But I'm talking about India maybe replacing the factory of yesterday of China. Now, can India become the next China is the question we want to ask. There's a few things I want to talk about. First of all, India is about a third the size of China, just to have an idea about the size of the country. But if you look at the population where the people live in China, they all live on less than a half of the country. 94% lives on the east coast or close to the east coast and only 6% lives in the remote western areas of China. What that means is that from an area point of view there's not so much difference of total population having been, uh, being on a certain area in China or in India. There's a little bit difference, but it's not a huge difference. Now, what is different is actually the arable land. India has more arable land than China has. And they both have 1.4 billion people about now, so they have to feed. India has more land to feed the same amount of people than China has. What that means is that both these countries have to do two things. One of them is to actually import products from around the world. Now China has the problem that a lot of countries in the rest of the world don't want to export as much anymore and so they're looking for new partners which is mostly, mainly the southern hemisphere and of course also Russia which is a very tough debated or a tough topic to talk about right now. But India can still rely on the West because they're a democracy and we somehow in the West, we like them a little bit more than China does specifically the last two, three years. But at the same time, they, both these countries have to go into a digital transformation. The big difference between India and China in terms of agriculture to feed its people, which is one of the most important things, is that China has less than 25% of the population that is related to providing food to the, to the population in the farmlands, so farmers. While in India it's almost 60%. So that urbanization in India has not happened like it has happened in China. And so that's a huge difference if you think about how the next 10, 20 years will look like. But it also means that India is needing to actually do what China did over the past 10 years, and that is to go completely in a digital transformation in the agriculture sector. Now, the other thing is demography. 
And that is a weak point of China, very clearly, where India has a real benefit. I mean, China's demography is like, there's very few children being born, just one child per family, and so people are getting older, they're getting, actually today, these days, Chinese are getting even older than many people in Europe, in, in European countries, and so they're getting older, they're getting richer, they're in the middle class, and there's no children being born, so they don't have the hands anymore. Of course, there's still 600 million people that are kind of in the low income, so they can still maybe for 10-15 years rely on this this demography but at one point it's going to end and this means China needs to robotize they need to innovate but there is where India doesn't have the problem and so India can become the hands that China is lacking and so I think this is a huge opportunity for India looking at the demography but it's also something interesting about diversity because if you want to innovate if you want to change if you want to create things I mean it's great to be part of the global village. China is insulating more and more, is more self-reliant and that on top of it that actually 96% of the Chinese are Han Chinese, they all speak the same language and this is huge advantage but the disadvantage is a little bit in diversity. Not that China is not a diverse country, I mean they're very diverse but compared to India I mean there's many more diversity looking at religion, looking at languages, looking at backgrounds, I mean it's a very diverse country. Now that diversity in India is also a problem sometimes or a challenge because there's the caste system which China doesn't have. So it's good and bad in both ways. But I do believe moving into the direction of the future where we see that actually India for the next 10, 15, 20 years has an opportunity to be stronger integrated with the world, China will be more insulated or isolated and that actually is an opportunity for India because of its diversity and the fact that we like to work with people that speak very good English. Now if you look at the millennials I think this is interesting and important because this is where the middle class and the consumption of, to of today is and Gen Z, the next generation, is the consumption of tomorrow or the consumers of tomorrow. Now if you look at China and India, and this is interesting, these millennials are very similar to each other in many, many ways. I mean, they have a lot of social pressure to succeed, so they like to conform. I mean, in India, I mean, they even marry out children and so on, and so they, they want to do well at work, they want to do well in school, they want to marry well. I mean, these are all things which is conforming. The same in China in a different way, but this both has to do with the culture that is still part of their tradition and their way of living. Well, we in the West have left a lot of that behind. There's also much more opportunity and resources for many of these, these millennials. They're very hopeful. They believe that they will have a better life than their parents and definitely than their grandparents. And I think the hope that these Two millennials in India and China has is what is feeding the country to transform it into the future and they're also very digital very very upward mobile generation I mean digital is just second nature for them and it might sound strange to talk about this digital transformation and and this mobile uh, generation today because we're all so used to it but actually for 1.4 billion people it means that they're like five to ten years ahead of many places in the West or in the rest of the world the difference of course is that Indian Millennials are much more global citizens they're much more westernized they actually have a lot of benefit by knowing English and it's a democracy so it's it's they're more welcomed by the global community or the Western global community I could say it while the Chinese it's much more about pride and nationalism they, they really want to be on themselves they're proud of their culture basically it's all about the past and taking that past into the future and working hard for for a better future, being more self-reliant, self-sufficient, and expect change. And so Chinese, they constantly want change. So both of these millennials move very, very fast, but it's for different reasons. But I think if you think about it, 50% of all the millennials in the world live in just these two countries. This is almost a billion people together. And for G Generation Z, it's the exact same thing. So this is what drives this economy and will change India. Now the opportunity for India for me is very clear. I mean, if you look at countries that are now pushing China, 
and China pushing country, companies out of China, it's very clear that there's going to be a decoupling from China. What that means is that both Chinese companies and foreign companies in China are actually looking to get out of China, specifically in the low quality production areas. It could be because of pollution, because Xi Jinping wants a better environment and so they don't abide according to the regulation anymore. They're going to Vietnam, to Bangladesh, to Malaysia, to all these places. But it could also be that India is now receptive for these Chinese lower end factories. So not the smart factory of tomorrow, but everything else. The products that we love so much in the West that cost less could now be produced in Southeast Asia and in, in India. And this is already happening very fast. But there's also a geopolitical aspect to it, where the tensions between China and, in, and China and the US are just increasing every single day. What that means is that actually India could benefit from being neutral and actually betting on both horses and doing business with both of them and taking whatever they could eat because these, when two dogs are fighting for one bone, the third one could be running off with it. And I see that India is very well positioned to be somehow the savior of the factory of tomorrow if you look at the tensions that is happening between China and the US. So there's a lot of opportunity and I think the next decade India could have a major transformation because of that. I'm looking forward to find that out in Mumbai this week. What you also see is that India has huge challenges and so to catch up with China I think India needs to do some real homework or house cleaning up their house because there's a huge problems and if there's anybody from India on my channel I would love you to comment on this because this is where I'm really looking at four main things that is holding India back and you might have four or you might disagree with some of these things. Bureaucracy is a big issue in India. Most foreign companies are complaining about it much more than about China because in China there's also a lot of bureaucracy but a lot of it has been digitized and it's actually been a quite oiled machine that has been running for a thousand years or almost. While in, in India is still a lot of paperwork, uh, red tape and so on. And then you have the whole politics in India which is very similar to places like in, in the United States where actually money decides politics and not like in China where politics decides money or drives money. So what that means is that every democratic leader that wants to get elected needs to get support and that also means that he needs his money for his campaigns but if he wins then he needs to do something back for the industry or for his backers. And so this is actually a problem in, in, in making planning, specifically when you think about infrastructure, about supply chain, about big investments, long-term investments. I mean, this is not always working in India's favor, despite that democracy should actually help. It's also a, a situation where there's a lot of corruption in the country. Now, China has had huge problems with corruption, still today, but this is on the top agenda of Xi Jinping, and so, India has not taken care of that as much as China has. And so you see a lot of protection as well, taxes that are quite high. And so it looks like India doesn't want the foreign countries to just flood it with products, flood it with services. They want to keep as self-reliant as possible, which in a way is not bad. But the problem is China's doing the same because they have to, not because they want to. China always wanted to open up as much as possible. Just the world doesn't want to supply, they have to be self-sufficient. But with India, it's much more system, systemic as a problem. And so I believe that unless India solves these huge problems, it's going to be hard to catch up and become the factory of the world, just like China is. But one of the biggest problems is actually the inequalities. And specifically when we talk about women, this is a huge issue in India where many women most actually are not included in the workforce of India. While in China it's almost 50% of the, of the women and the men, I mean it's almost equal in terms of contributing to the wealth of the country. While in India it's really very low in percentage of women that are contributing. This is cultural, this is the past. But you also see the caste system where the lowest caste or the untouchables like we often say are actually very little 
helping to, inc to, to increase the wealth of the whole country. They're not included in that wealth building in that future. They could all be going into the factories, both women and these lower castes, to build the products that we love so much everywhere else. But it's not happening because of the systemic problem. And another systemic problem in, in India has to do with the informal contracts and the unregular wages that they have. Basically, not like in China, they're not on fixed contracts, fixed hours pay having where the boss like I used to have employees I had to pay 44% social security that means they get benefits they get health care they get pensions and so I had to pay all this well in India most of the bosses don't pay this which means they're actually left alone those people those employees are not able to improve their life so much and there's a lot of risk if they fall ill or they become old, I mean, it's really the family that has to take care of it. And so this is a systemic problem. And so in order to become the factory of tomorrow, I believe India needs to fix this problem. But it looks like they want to fix it, but how fast they can fix it is the big question. Now, I believe the next 10 years, India will have huge opportunities because I believe India is like 10 years to 15 years behind China in many of the opportunities that China had. Of course, systemic problems need to, be f need to be fixed, but China also has systemic problems. Think about the debt of China, the real estate of China, and so on. But for India, I do believe if they can fix some of these systemic problems, I mean agriculture development and specifically technology, agri-tech, food tech, will have a huge opportunity in China. Of course, everything related with technology because they're so good at it. Think about Web 3.0, the metaverse, think about FinTech. I mean, this is where India could really lead the world. We also see health tech could actually improve a lot, specifically because the healthcare spending is going up every year because people are getting more in the middle class. And so there's an opportunity, there's a market there. And they have smart people to develop these applications and have telemedicine because they have the same environment as China very often. Of course, the real estate a boom that will happen, we will see definitely infrastructure. It's needed for logistics, it's needed for supply chain, it's needed for getting people into urban areas. So that is something, if they don't do that fast enough and you see it happening now, then actually it's gonna be difficult to catch up with China. Automotive industry is something that I definitely see same as China, specifically in electrical vehicles. I mean, there's a lot of people getting into the middle class and that also means fast moving consumer goods. And so these are like six industries and there's more than that, that I believe that India could really have a complete change into the future. And many of them means that they could actually catch up with China, but maybe 10 years behind and maybe not on the factory of tomorrow, but the factory of today. And so the whole question is, how fast will India catch up with China or could India become the next China? And I think the places where the biggest transformation still needs to happen, but will happen, are in all the humane industries. Think about agriculture, think about healthcare, think about education, all these places where it's about people improving their lives, going from the bottom up, actually going into the middle class. I think that's where India is still lagging behind China 10, maybe 20 years. And this graph that you can see here was made in 2011, and it shows the number of years that India is behind. Now, if we would take the graph today, I mean, India has not caught up as fast as we thought, simply because China moved faster than we expected. But still, we see that in many terms, whether it's in, in agriculture spender, in GDP per person, whether it's in internet users, I mean, millennials, all this, China has the same amount as India today. I mean, they've caught up. But when it's about industries to change people's life, I mean, they're still 10, maybe 15 years behind. But that also means there's an opportunity. And so this elephant might be catching up the dragon very quickly quickly or at least now that China is his growth is going down and they have more problems to solve internally actually what you could see is that India could fly away and actually go very very fast and so I believe India is really on a moment in time where it could go really really fast now the only question is
which color of the elephant do we have to watch? Because there's so many directions that it could go. But I'm actually very positive and bullish that India is at a unique time and moment to actually catch up with many places in China. The only question is, what will it mean geopolitically these days? Is it going to be an opportunity for India? Is it going to create an economic crisis worldwide? And what should we watch in general? But I'm all going to find that out in the next week because I'm going to Mumbai and I hope one day to be able to tell you. Now, just one comment I want to make still for people who watch my videos very often. I mean, I'm traveling the world these days and it's been very, very difficult for me to keep up with making a video every, every week. So I'm going to shift that to every two weeks simply because it's unattainable. It's not possible anymore for me. I've been in Brazil last week. I was in Portugal and I'm, I'm flying around. And so it's very difficult to make this video, but I'm going to try and make at least two to three every month still. That's a promise I make. But I hope that one day we will all be able to figure out what the world of tomorrow looks like and whether India can actually one day become a great partner of China and maybe together be the biggest economy of the world again, like they used to be before the 19th century. See you very soon for another episode on Pascal's China Lens.